Yes, we can get started. It's the live. Inshallah. In Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiru wa na'uzu billah min shiruri anfusina min sayyi'ati amalina man yahdihillahu falamudillana wa man yudlil falahadiyana ashadu wa la ilaha illallahu wa ahduhu la sharika la anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu ya ayyuhal lazina amanu takullaha haqqa tukatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun ya ayyuhal nas attaku rabbukum alazi khalakakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaka minha zawjaha وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَنِسَاءً وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ رَقِيبًا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَكُونُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا يُصْلِحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ مَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا أَمَّا بَعْدُ رَبِّ اشْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَأَحْلُلْ عُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُوا قَوْلِي الحمد لله رب العالمين my dear brothers and sisters we are here once again reflecting on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're towards the tail end of this series now, you know, and as we inch closer to the conclusion of this khutbah series, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us all to benefit from these reflections. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all guidance and make us from among those who are rightly guided. Ameen. Allahumma ameen. So today, uh, we're going to reflect on the name al-warith, which means the inheritor. So to inherit something means that you survive longer than the one who possessed that thing you inherited, meaning that someone is no longer where they are, thus allowing us to inherit the thing that is left behind. So an obvious example of this is when parents die, uh, you know, they leave their belongings to their children and the children who are surviving their parents are the beneficiaries of the possessions their parents collected over their lifetime. So this tells us that there is a component of time as well in that we are all survivors of those who have passed on and we're all beneficiaries of the legacies that have been left behind by those people. So if you recall from the last reflection we had, we discussed the name Al-Baqi. And Al-Baqi means the everlasting. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everlasting. And Allah Jalla Jalalu was there before anything existed and will be there to continue to exist after all creation has perished. And because Allah outlasts every creation, he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the inheritor of everything. So Allah is therefore also al warith the inheritor. So everything that we have in our possession that we believe, we own, really belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in uh, Surah Al-Hijr, we are told, It is we who give life and death. It is we who inherit everything. And we in this uh, translation is the majestic we. And if we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the true owner of every creation and everything we possess, then how are we able to use the things we have for our benefit? How can we use it? Because we have been given this illusion of agency. That's how we're able to use it. So you might think, why am I calling this an illusion? So just like all illusions come to an end, and then at the end of that illusion, the audience watching the illusion is in awe at the end of it. You know, how many times have we gasped or felt surprised when someone we know or love passes away? The common phrase that comes to our mind sometimes is, oh my goodness, how come? So that surprise is the end of that illusion. And I'm sure all of us have at least one example we can relate to. So when we meet our end, we leave everything behind for someone else to inherit and benefit from. So we need to have this agency for us to operate in this world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this. And he, Jalla Jalalu, has allowed us to use this, which belongs to him. So this capability is from Allah that we have. And we believe that when we own everything in this world, that it is in our possession. That is the nature of human being. We have something, we believe we own that thing. And if we truly were the owners of those things, then we would be able to take our possessions with us after we die. But that's not the case. We know that. And we know also that dying is a solitary experience where we leave this world without any physical possessions whatsoever. In fact, dying is guaranteed to be a solitary experience. And how do we know this? We can hire people to do all sorts of things for us. We can hire people to make our lives a little easier, you know, by running errands 
We can use that free time to then pursue other goals. We can hire people to take care of our homes and our cars and our pets. We can hire people to take care of our children or the elderly that might live with us. So we can hire people to do all sorts of things for us to help us achieve other goals. But what we can't hire someone to do for us is the work of dying. And that's why it's guaranteed to be a solitary experience. When it is our time to leave this earth, we will each do it alone. And on the day of judgment, we will all be brought together one at a time in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be held accountable for our deeds. So let's come back to the word inheritance. What is the first thought that usually comes to mind when we think about inheritance? Usually, it's wealth or money or some kind of material possession. And it's usually about how much of that is going to be inherited. And this follows all kinds of legal rules and whatnot uh, with land and other possessions. Uh, but you know that's how our psyche is wired. That is how the world is built. These are the kinds of rules that we set out there for ourselves. And, and as a Muslim, Allah does not forbid us from becoming wealthy. There is no prohibition, at least to my awareness, from becoming wealthy or being Muslim and becoming wealthy. There are halal ways to build wealth and there are haram ways to build wealth. But there's no prohibition that says you can't accumulate wealth. So if we're given wealth, we should feel eternally grateful because it is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is testing us to see how we will spend it in this world. So if you look at the companions of the Prophet, uh, some of them would be tremendously wealthy, even by our standards today. Yet, they gave what they had for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they didn't treat their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a transaction. They didn't take their wealth to give themselves the authority to buy their way into Jannah. So they didn't, they didn't see wealth as a vehicle to buy their way. They took their wealth as a trust or an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with every penny they spent, they spent it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to help the Prophet sallallahu So every good deed they did was for this purpose. And these companions were the best of people after the Prophets. Um, so it was not because of their wealth that they were pious or they had piety. Their piety came from the way they conducted themselves, the way they used the um, the ownership they had of possessions uh, in the in their lifetime, and the word in Arabic for having this level of God consciousness is taqwa. So in English, the word taqwa is typically translated as the fear of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But it's not so much about fear because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, we know one of His attributes is Ar Rahim, the Most Merciful. Well, how could we ever be afraid of someone who is the Most Merciful? So taqwa is Less about fear, more about avoidance. And it's the avoidance of actions that are displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the companions of the Prophet وسلم, avoided actions that would be displeasing. So imagine having any of these companions as your friend. Just imagine being in their company. How much benefit can we draw from them? I'm sure it's a ton or immeasurable. Having someone like that around us would likely inspire us to follow in their actions. And it's in our nature to copy others when we are new to something. Maybe we're not new, maybe we're new to being generous because we're always so tight fisted with the resources at our disposal. And having somebody like that would allow us to open that tight fist so that we can be more generous and learn that skill. And children do this all the time. They look at people around them and try and copy and learn. That's how we learn language. And if we surround ourselves with people who are pious and people who are inclined towards seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we ourselves would feel inclined towards um, you know, just copying them, copying their actions uh, and building our relationship with them while we're doing these kinds of things. And that's another way for us to build social support for ourselves, especially when we age and when we get older or, or in a time of our need. So by the same convention of how we treat relationship with people, you know, we can't say the same thing about money. Being the, in the company of the prophets or the companions of the prophets or the people who are like that is very different. Being close to them gives you benefit, 
But in the case of money, or in the or being in possession of lots of money itself, alone does not benefit us. And absolutely no doubt, it's nice to have lots of money because it takes away fears from our hearts. It takes away certain pressures. You know, there's bills that everybody has to pay. And just having some level of disposable income in our hands absolutely takes some of that fears away. But the ownership of money by itself has no benefit to us. Okay, the moment we spend that money, that's when the benefit comes. So the only time money is of any benefit or value to us is when we relinquish ownership of it. You know, money sitting in our bank accounts or 401k or any other medium is not doing anything for us. Sure, it's growing, you know, as long as we're doing it in the halal way, it's growing. Uh, and it's only when we take that money and spend it or in, and pass the ownership of that money to somebody else does it actually serve us? So to think that the companions of the prophets who were wealthy were pious because of their wealth would be short-sighted on our part. And these wealthy companions knew that giving up ownership of their wealth and spending it in the causes that were pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is how they will attain piety. And in today's day and age, what do we do when we want to increase ourselves in piety? What do we do when we decide we want to bring ourselves closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, one way, one way is that we might we might decide, you know what, I'm going to listen to more lectures, I'm going to watch videos on YouTube, I'm going to listen to these Islamic scholars more and more on podcasts. You know, we might start going to more of these Islamic conferences as well. There's plenty of those in, in, in the US as well as in Canada. And we might start spending many more hours each week just listening to some chef or some mufti, either on YouTube or podcast or anywhere else we consume medium uh, or media from. And we do this because internally we recognize that, you know, maybe this is how we can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by increase our uh, personal knowledge uh, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that God consciousness and that knowledge equation becomes how we try and increase ourselves in piety. And I'm sure all of this sounds familiar to you, and I'm sure you can either relate to it or you can think of other people in your circle who are like that. But what good is the accumulation of all this knowledge if we can't even act on it? You know, just like money, the more knowledge we have, it doesn't benefit us until we actually put it to practice. But unlike money, spending our knowledge on others increases us in knowledge. Possessing knowledge that is not practiced and not shared with others has zero benefit to us. So having ownership of knowledge alone is not going to increase us in piety either. So another way to think about this is that when you download an app from the internet on your laptop or your desktop computer, that app is not going to do you any good until you double click and install it. So that knowledge in your possession is like that app that's just sitting there waiting to be installed. So I'm not advocating with all this to say, you know, don't watch lectures, uh, don't listen to any sheikh or mufti on YouTube or podcasts or wherever you get your content from. Um, not suggesting that at all. But we should all, at least at some level, remind ourselves that all this learning that we're doing needs to be of value and service to other folks. You know, so unless we act on this knowledge and put it into action, the collection of knowledge alone is not going to allow us to leave a legacy in this world. Again, reminding ourselves that whatever we have is the legacy of somebody else who preceded us. And if you study Surah Al-Kahf, um, you know, we learned that on the day of judgment, we will ask about how we spent our knowledge and how we spent our wealth. Those are two of the four things we're asked about, or we, we are told about that we'll be asked on the day of judgment. So if we have more knowledge than most people then there's a greater responsibility on us to spend this knowledge for the benefit of others. And with knowledge, it must also be practiced for it to be taught. So possessing knowledge, practicing knowledge, then can you teach it and share it. And as Muslims, we cannot attain piety unless we practice what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us. And it's not difficult. All it takes is just a little bit of discipline. So if practicing Islam were predicated on going to lectures and conferences and watching YouTube videos or podcasts or memorizing the entire Quran, 
the barrier to entry would be very high. Nobody would be so inclined or the Muslim population would be so small, you know, it'd be difficult. So what are these minimum requirements? The minimum requirements to be, to enter into Islam is the Shahada. It is that simple that Allah has made it. That's it, just the Shahada. So with that alone, once you declare um, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at that moment, you have now inherited the community of those who strive for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what comes after the Shahada? Next comes Salah. You must learn how to perform wudu. Memorize a couple of short chapters from the Quran. And now you've become a practicing Muslim. You have now inherited the legacy of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. And once you've mastered Salah, next comes Zakah. And this is giving 2.5% of your wealth for the benefit of the needy. Now we are learning with this step how to leave our own legacy. We're learning to create good deeds that perpetually benefit us in the hereafter by using the one resource that only benefits us when we actually give it away. And these good deeds are the only thing that we will inherit from this world on the day of judgment. Nothing from our wealth, our home, our cars will benefit us on the day of judgment. Good deeds are our inheritance on the day of judgment. And once we have mastered zakah, next comes fasting. And this becomes important, especially in the month of Ramadan. And all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to fast for the sake of Allah. And fasting is not just refraining from food and water, it is also refraining from that which is normally permissible or halal to us for a period of a month. And once you master fasting, now you have inherited the perseverance and self-control of all the prophets. And how powerful of an inheritance is that? And as Muslims, we are all the beneficiaries, we are all beneficiaries of the perseverance and strength that was displayed by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So imagine if uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam decided one day that, you know what? Too difficult, not carrying this message of Islam. Imagine if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave into the belligerent attitude of the Quraysh. Too much torture, not having it. You know, these people were once his friends and his family members who then later persecuted him for calling them to one God. And imagine if Rasulullah gave up after he was heckled and stoned out of the city of Ta'if when he journeyed there to spread the message of Islam. And imagine if the Prophet gave up after he lost his beloved wife, Khadija anha, who encouraged him to keep going. And she was the first to believe him to be a prophet of Allah. And if the Prophet would have given up, you and I would not be Muslims today. You and I would not inherit the legacy of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You and I would not benefit from the Quran that is the last revelation of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And there is tremendous gratitude that we owe to the inheritance left behind by our beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In Surah Al Anbiya, we are reminded, and this is a verse that many of the scholars recite time and time again: "Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatul alamin." It was only as a mercy that we sent you, Prophet, to all people. And as Muslims, we would be fooling ourselves if we believe that we have never received an inheritance in our lifetime. This gift of Islam that we hold dear to us is our inheritance. It is the inheritance that we receive as Muslims. And inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate our understanding of the Quran and increase us in knowledge and give us the wisdom that gives us the ability to apply this knowledge when we need it most. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, as with every attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we must learn how we can apply this in our day-to-day -day lives. How can we do this with al -wadif? You know, if we go back to... Um, what I said about Muslims inheriting the legacy of the Prophet Sallallahu You know, Rasulullah, we should realize that as Muslims, we are a people of service. We don't have to look far and wide to arrive at this conclusion. All we have to do is look at the life of the Prophet Sallallahu We see that he uh, led his life 
um, since he was young to, you know, the time he passed away with nothing but service. He cared for his community by setting the best of examples through the work that he did, through his interactions with people. So if you think about him as a shepherd, uh, he was gentle to his flock. And this was at a time when people were not gentle to one another. You know, yet he carried his, he cared for his uh, flock of animals to not only sustain himself and earn a living, but he did it with kindness and gentle attitude. As a merchant, so his uncle Abu Talib was also a merchant, so he picked up the trade of, of being in business. He was honest in his dealings with people. And this was at a time when people found it hard to trust one another. There was almost no trust because of the way people treated one another. And this earned him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the nickname of Sadiq, which means honest or trustworthy, and Amin, which means truth. And because Rasulullah grew up as an orphan, he helped others who needed help because that was something that he saw as a challenge in his own personal life and he wanted to make sure that others did not experience that. So once again, just by doing those little acts of kindness, we see that he had a bias towards service. So when the call came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to carry the message of Islam, he took on the challenge and served Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best way he saw Allah could. So when we serve others, we are doing good in this world that will become our inheritance on the day of judgment. And the knowledge and wealth that we have, we should think about spending it and sharing it and practicing it because that is how we will build a lasting legacy and a legacy that gives us perpetual good in, in this world even after we die is what is called in Arabic sadaqa jariya or perpetual good. And some examples of sadaqa jariya are investing in Islamic schools, that teach Islamic values. The children that grow up who graduate from these institutions become a reflection of our investment and give us continual benefit in that respect. Another example is to um, invest in mosques. You know, as, as congregates frequent the mosque, we receive the blessings of having invested in the construction and maintenance of the services a mosque offers to the community. So it's not just investing in structures and institutions. Those are not the only ways we can earn sadaqa jariya. You know, we should consider community, communities that need um, basic services like access to clean water. There are programs that today we can invest in that give clean water, work on giving clean water to communities that need it. And you could also consider investing in people who are keen on giving their life to the service of Islam or serving Muslims by advocating for them in government or preserving the history of Muslims around the world or even in Islamic scholarship. So how often do we hear about teachers being unpaid and yet they're caretakers of the future leaders of our communities? That too is another example, another way for us to make sure that we invest for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in people, not just the institutions, but also in people. And that's not a common topic that we, we hear about in our, uh, in our community, but investing in schools and masajids definitely but also investing in people is something we should consider. Maybe set up a scholarship so that students can pay for college, which is getting you know, more expensive by the year. And as long as we are acting with intention of serving others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will certainly make us from among those who are rightly guided. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with pious spouses and offsprings who will be the joy of our hearts and make us models for the righteous. And I ask Allah to give us all the guidance and keep us on the path that will lead us all to genital pardos. And I ask Allah to forgive our sins, absolve us of our misdeeds, and allow us each to die as one of the virtuous. And I ask Allah to make us from among those uh, who, are, who keep up prayer and our descendants who keep up prayer. And I ask Allah to forgive us, our parents and the believers in the day of judgment, when the judgment will come to pass on all of us. ربنا حبنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا كرة أعيننا وجعل الله المتقين إماما ربنا فقر لنا زنوبنا وكفر أن سياتنا وتوفنا ما لبرار رب جلني مكيم الصلاة ومن زرياتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا خبر لي ولوالدي أو للمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا آمنا فقر لنا ورحمنا وأنت خير الراحمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذو القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لا لكم تذكرون لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة يا ما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين اللهم آمين